this post antibiotic age. So we're looking for different ways that we can treat patients without the need of antibiotics. Um, and why is this so important? So again, we're going to be kind of going through a little bit of everything today. Um, and for those of you who hopefully heard from Dr. Paul Mayer, he's amazing. I'm sure as you could all tell, ton of information from him. This is my second time listening to him. Um, and it just truly gets better every single time. So hopefully now I'm going to kind of be able to tie everything together. So now that we've kind of heard about all the different things relating to systemic diseases, how can we better treat our patients again without the help of antibiotics? So some of our learning objectives that we're going to be going over today, mindset shifts about antibiotics from just in case to absolutely necessary, um, identifying some of the benefits and limitations of using antimicrobials for biofilm management, recognizing patient types, candidates who can benefit from pair protect trays and um, appropriate tray protocols, and just using a simple number to help patients understand the importance of treatment. So um, we have a specific number, maybe your number is different, um, but again, I think establishing a number is what's important, especially in a multi-doctor, multi-hygienist practice. So again, we are truly in a post-antibiotic age. So what does this mean? Antibiotics that we once relied on are being overprescribed, overused, and are causing antibiotic resistance. And what's so super important about antibiotic resistance is the fact that it infects somebody in the United States every 11 seconds and kills somebody every 15 minutes. Um, and all the citations should be available at the bottom of the slide. So if you guys need those, again, feel, feel free to copy and paste. Um, you're going to have access to all of this. So this is why this is so important that we can't continue to treat these patients with more antibiotics. We really should be utilizing something different. And why is this so important to us as dental professionals? Dentists prescribe 10% of all outpatient antibiotic prescriptions in the United States, which is roughly about 25.7 million, um, but they are the number one prescribers of clindamycin. And as we all know, clindamycin is the number one antibiotic associated with C. diff. Um, if you've never heard Dr. Rowling's C. diff presentation, superbug presentation, um, I highly encourage you to take the time out either to um, do one that's up and coming. We just did one the other night um, or to go back and listen to a recorded one because it is absolutely amazing. And her story um, is, is truly mind opening. So again, being able to listen to that and taking that information back to your practice is what's important here. So again, why is this so important? We talked about clindamycin being the number one antibiotic associated with C. diff. It does have the highest rate of adverse drug reactions or ADR. Um, one single dose of clindamycin, so 600 milligram dose, can result in a C. diff infection or a CDI. Um, so these might be different acronyms that you're going to hear throughout the training um, and throughout the presentation. And antibiotic use extending past 72 hours had an 8% chance of better um, developing C. diff. So again, it's really important that even if we're just pursuing prescribing antibiotics for 24 hours, needing to know the risks that we're putting our patients at. And again, one of the biggest risks is um, C. diff. So how can we prevent it? What is it? How can we understand it a little bit better? Um, it's gram positive. It's an obligate anaerobe. It's rod shaped. It's transmitted oral fecal. It's toxin producing and it's vegetative spore. So we're going to kind of go into um, all these different things about C. diff. So in its vegetated form, um, it can actually live on moist surfaces for um, six hours. It's susceptible to gastric acids, um, antimicrobial soaps and alcohol based sanitizers, hand sanitizers. In its spore form, it can live on surfaces for six months. Um, it's resistant to gastric acids, antimicrobial soaps, and alcohol-based hand sanitizers. So again, it's important that we're kind of understanding um, a little bit more about C. diff and what can we really do to be able to prevent it. And again, a lot of the times, um, obviously this can be found in dental offices, but hospitals are like one of the number one places that you're going to find C. diff spores. And again, they can live on the surface for a very, very long time. And also talking about antimicrobials and different things that we can use to help kill spores. Um, if you've never listened to Dr. Rowling's other presentation about hypochlorous acid and things like that, you definitely should. So going back to all these different presentations, that way it kind of ties it all together for you guys. Um, but the colon's first line of defense is going to be um, colonization resistance. So it's a colony of microbes that prevent pathogens from uh, or that help fight C. diff, essentially. So if we don't have this first line of resistance, then it's going to allow us to better 
um, get C. diff essentially. So again, it's really important that we're not burdening our immune system so that we have these front lines of defense. So what happens when we add antibiotics into this whole mixture essentially? So colonization resistance, which again is that first line of defense, is disrupted when antibiotics are introduced, which allows C. diff to produce toxins and cause system, symptoms such as fever, nausea, um, diarrhea, dehydration, kidney failure, ileus, toxic megacolon. Um, if you have never seen images of toxic megacolon, um, spare yourself. Um, if you just did a quick, simple Google search, you would see that it's very, very severe. And often, um, whenever we're experiencing symptoms of C. diff, a lot of it can be gastric. Um, and some, you know, don't make the mistake of prescribing an anti-diarrheal because again, that's just going to back things up and curse, further cause inflammation. So that's where toxic megacolon is going to come in. So who's at risk? Um, let's talk about it. Anyone really is at risk, um, especially anyone taking antibiotics, anyone who's admitted to the hospital. Again, hospitals are like the number one source. Um, anyone over the age of uh, 65, female patients especially, um, immunocompromised, and then prior CDI, which is prior C. diff infection. So now that we know a little bit more about C. diff and um, what it is and, you know, how we can kind of look at it differently. Again, we need to be the change in the dental office and understand C. diff, understand its complications. We really need to be practicing antibiotic stewardship. Um, and the first time I talked to, or I listened to Dr. Paul Mayer talk about um, antibiotic stewardship was absolutely mind-blowing um, because, again, there were so many dental offices that I personally knew that were still prescribing clindamycin as a pre-med. Um, so, again, what can we do to kind of switch up some of our protocols? I think it's important that we get together as a team and decide, hey, are we no longer going to prescribe clindamycin? What can we prescribe in instead? And really, can we practice better antibiotic stewardship? Again, implement guidelines for prescription or for prescribing antibiotics. Um, the guidelines change, guys. That's very plain and simple. We're no longer just prescribing antibiotics or prescribing pre-med um, for anything really other than infective endocarditis. Um, so again, kind of re reviewing some of those protocols and making sure that we're all up to date in the dental office. Um, infection control, obviously, is going to be a huge one. Again, looking at different ways that we can use other products. Um, not that Cavi Wipes is a, an amazing product because that's what I used as a hygienist for a very, very long time. But again, it's not going to kill C. diff spores. We really need to be using hypochlorous acid instead. So review some of our infection control um, things that we're utilizing in the dental office. And then using adjunctive theirs to reduce bacterial load, the reduce the chance of a bacteremia, and reduce the risk of infection, really. Um, and this is something that I talk about every single day as a trainer here with Paraprotect. Um, as a hygienist, it was something that I had used on my own patients for um, eight years of my career. I've been a hygienist for 10. So again, it's really important that we kind of think outside of the box and look at periodontal disease differently. And instead of uh, more traditionally, you know, just traditional scaling and root planing or traditional antibiotics, and when we're talking about bacteremias, because I know that you heard a lot about it, this from Dr. Paul Meyer, um, different ways that we're treating patients can actually put patients at risk for bacteremia. So again, for an extraction, there's a 100% chance of bacteremia. Doesn't get much higher than that. Um, scaling and root planing or scaling even procedures put patients at a 70% risk for bacteremias. So what I used to tell patients is, is that Bacteria in the mouth is bacteria on the brain, bacteria in the heart, bacteria in the bloodstream. So it's really important that we reduce bacterial loads overall, starting localized, starting in the mouth. So again, we have less bacteria going into other areas of the body and triggering those immune responses. So how do we manage bacteria with these patients? Well, again, we know that when patients are using traditional brushes, um, let me flip to this slide quickly. Again, we're not able to reach the infection. Uh, we're really only able to reach about two and a half millimeters with a traditional toothbrush, maybe a little bit more with floss or a water pick. I know water picks can reach up to six millimeters, which is amazing. Um, I do question how accurate patients are um, with those types of modalities because I know that my own patients were kind of struggling at home. Um, but again, how can we manage this bacteria? 
So there's about 4 million bacteria roughly um, just on the end of a ballpoint pen. So if that kind of helps put into perspective of how much bacteria is truly down in these pockets that we're not seeing clinically. Um, and that pocket becomes more anaerobic the deeper that it becomes. So again, and just allowing those oxygen hating bacteria to replicate and to multiply. So we really needed a way that we could manage bacteria every single day, multiple times a day. Um, and again, this is going to be going off of patient type, patient protocols, things like that. But again, the best way that I knew how was with the help of the Paraprotect tray. So there's a few points that you can make when you're talking to your patients about Paraprotect to kind of help them differentiate this from anything else that they could purchase, you know, at the store or maybe that they've had previously made by their dentist or by their, um, medical doctor, whatever the case may be. So the Paraprotect tray is FDA cleared. And we say FDA cleared because the FDA does not require approval on a class two medical device. Um, so something such as a class three medical device, which does require approval, is something such as a pacemaker or a joint prosthesis. So if a patient comes to you and says, why are you saying cleared, not approved? It's just simply because the FDA doesn't require approval on a class two medical device, simple as that. Um, the tray is patented also, so you are sending it off to a certified Paraprotect lab to be fabricated. And not only are they fabricating it to the patient's dentition, but to the depth of their periodontal pocket. So you do need to send in that most recent probing for that patient. I like to see anything um, between um, six months, obviously, is kind of the, the top of what I like to see, but definitely nothing over a year. We should be probing much more frequently than that, as we all know. Um, but again, they are truly making these trays to the depth of the pocket. And the research shows that we can deliver up to nine millimeters, which is super exciting in terms of treating moderate to severe periodontal disease. Now, what is it exactly that we're delivering? Um, we have a 1.7% hydrogen peroxide gel. As all of us know, we've been using hydrogen peroxide for years and years in dentistry, um, equally as long in the medical field as well. And again, it's miraculous for, for multiple reasons, but specifically at 1.7%, we're targeting anaerobic bacteria. So unlike when patients would rinse with full strength hydrogen peroxide and we're killing the good bacteria as well as the bad bacteria, we don't run that risk at 1.7% hydrogen peroxide. So when your patients come to you and they say, I was always told not to use hydrogen peroxide. Now you're telling me to use hydrogen peroxide. I don't really know what to believe. Tell them that we're making hydrogen peroxide naturally. Number one, every single day in our bodies, um, in our lungs, our liver, our white blood cells, pregnant women are producing it in their breast milk. So it is a naturally occurring substance. That's number one. Number two, a lot of the things that they've heard about hydrogen peroxide in the past have been at really high concentrations. Again, we're 1.7, but they make hydrogen peroxide all the way up to 35%. So just reassure your patients that, again, this is naturally occurring and it is completely safe to be used every day multiple times a day. They did also conduct a six-year study on 1.7% hydrogen peroxide um, where they followed patients to use it every single day, multiple times a day, and there was no carcinogenic effects no adverse events. So again, it's really important that we explain this to patients and let them know it is safe to be used. Um, this is what the tray looks like if you've never seen a Paraprotect tray in person. Maybe you've heard about Paraprotect through different articles, different websites, um, different presentations, KOLs, things like that. Um, the tray is very flexible. Um, it's very thin also. It's only about two to two and a half millimeters thick. Extremely comfortable. Um, if I had my trays in, you probably wouldn't even know that I had them in because I've been wearing them for so long. Um, so my speech is not impaired or anything like that. But patients are really only wearing these trays for 10 to 15 minutes. So the hydrogen peroxide gel is going to break down after about 17 minutes once it reaches saliva. And then again, they're going to lose their efficacy of the gel after that time frame. So let's kind of go into this a little bit more because I do want to elaborate. Um, this is our in vitro study done on our 1.7% hydrogen peroxide gel. And again, there's a few points that I want you to take away from this study in particular. So the first one being is that this study was solely done on streptococcus mutans, which as we all know, is one of the number one bacteria associated with decay or dental caries. The reason why we did it on strep mutans is because... Sorry if you can hear my dogs barking in the background. <laughs> um, is because we know that hydrogen peroxide is extremely effective against periodontal pathogens. The majority of them are gram-negative anaerobic. So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to deliver oxygen 
to those anaerobic environments to create more of an oxygen rich environment at the expense of the bad bacteria. The other part about strep mutans is the fact that it has one of the thickest matrices to be able to penetrate. So we knew that if we could penetrate strep mutans, we're going to be equally as effective against periodontal pathogens as well. So going back to the slide, in the very first slide where you see all the green, that's where we let strep mutans grow for three days. We're like, okay, we're going to let it grow and then we're going to try and treat it. So in the middle slide is where we treated it for just five minutes. As you can see, not a whole lot has happened. Only five minutes has passed. Um, the gel is really effective within the first seven to 10 minutes. So again, not a whole lot at that five minute time frame. The magic is really happening in the very last slide. And that's where we treated it for 10 minutes and we were able to kill 100% of surface strep mutans. So I do encourage you as clinicians, don't be afraid to treat just your periodontal patients. You could also be potentially treating your high care resource patients as well. Um, and again, we do have two different gels. So kind of talking about the differences in those gels. I know Dr. Palmer just talked about xylitol, which is an amazing product. Um, so we actually do have a xylitol gel. Um, our original gel, which has been out for 18 years um, is sweetened with saccharin and it's extremely minty. I personally love our original gel. Um, that's what I was used to for a very long time. But as of the last two years, we came out with the xylitol gel formula. Um, so just to kind of recap, again, xylitol is really effective against um, caries prevention, also to uh, help increase salivary flow and help balance pH in the mouth. And that xylitol study that he showed about People who were chewing gum had less um, preterm birth weight. That's absolutely astonishing. So how cool is that to be able to, again, reiterate that to your patients? So we did want to provide two separate formulas for you guys to be able to present to your patients. And I know a lot of my more um, holistic patients really like the idea of the xylitol as well, because again, it is a natural plant sugar. So it will come with a more mild mint flavor in comparison to the saccharin formula. So when you're looking at this, um, again, this is another picture of the tray. That way you can kind of see how thin and flexible it is. We're just going to do one thin ribbon of gel all the way around the tray. So it really doesn't take much. The whole science behind the tray is the fact that it has an inner peripheral seal along the gingival margin that's going to help push the medicament below the gum line into the sulcus, past the curricular fluid, again, up to nine millimeters. So that's truly the science on how the tray works. So again, if you have a patient who says, I've already got something like this at home, right? It's sitting on my nightstand. Explain to them that this tray is truly different because it has that inner peripheral seal. So it's not just enough for us to be able to push the medicament to the depth of the pocket. We also have to be able to hold it on contact so it can be effective. So again, the gasket like seal is gonna hold it on contact for 10 to 15 minutes via the person who's using it. And that's where we're gonna get the most benefit out of the gel. So again, explain to patients that they can't just rinse with hydrogen peroxide and be able to get the same results. We have to be able to hold 1.7% hydrogen peroxide on contact um, to be able to debride and alter the bacteria. Otherwise, we're just experiencing what's called a burst effect, which means it goes on contact and then it very quickly dissipates, again, versus being able to be held in the tray. So how can you send um, models to us, scans to us? How can you become a provider? Again, you do have to be a certified Paraprotect provider to be able to send scans um, to the lab because it is FDA cleared and it is patented. Um, I know a lot of offices are using 3D, which is absolutely amazing. So your scans are going to be at our lab in 20 minutes, um, and we're going to be able to turn these trays around to you in about a week, which is um absolutely amazing and much quicker than when I first started with Paraprotect because I was sending in um, models, PBS impressions, you know, whatever the case may be. Now, for those of us who aren't 3D just yet, um, hopefully we're going to be getting there very soon, but we do still accept traditional models and impressions. Um, some offices don't even have a lab in their office. So again, we do still um, offer those services for you guys. So just know your turnaround time and also know that you're going to need four millimeters of tissue above your gingival margin, as well as little to no voids. So a very beautiful set of scans is going to get you back a beautiful set of trays, just like a beautiful set of models is going to get you back a beautiful set of trays. We want to limit the voids, have all the anatomy and have that um, really nice vestibule on the tray. 
So again, talking a little bit more about hydrogen peroxide and again, why it's so wonderful. Again, we know that we've been using it for a very, very long time. It is a wonderful wound cleaner. And when you're thinking about hydrogen peroxide um, or when you're thinking about periodontal disease, that's really exactly what it is, is it's a chronic wound. And again, it's a broad spectrum antimicrobial. It's gonna help to disrupt that slimy biofilm matrix that we were talking about, help to bride the bacterial cell wall deliver oxygen to those anaerobic environments, and no allergic reactions. We are making hydrogen peroxide naturally, like I just said. So remind your patients of this. This is safe to be used. Um, and something that I forgot to include on this slide, which completely escapes me, um, is the fact that bacteria cannot build up resistances to hydrogen peroxide like they do to antibiotics. So again, this is so super important as to bring all of this information together because we know that when we overuse and overprescribe antibiotics, we're putting these patients at risk for creating antibiotic resistant bacteria, which again could potentially lead to C. diff. So the silver lining of all of this is that bacteria can't build up those same resistances to hydrogen peroxide. So that's why we should be using something more natural, such as H2O2. So who are our patient candidates? Who should we be recommending this to? Um, definitely our periodontal maintenance patients. So for if there are hygienists um, in, the, in the seminar, look back at your patients last week who, you, who went through scaling and root planning or who you just finished scaling and root planning on. Um, and if you're going to be reevaluating them within, you know, three to four weeks or whatever your time frame is, are they still having bleeding? Are they still having pocketing? And a lot of the time, this is really because there are three bacteria that are resistant to scaling and root planing. It's AA, PG, and TF. So again, if we can't touch them while we're scaling and root planing, we're leaving them behind. And we just went below the gum line with an instrument and disrupted the colony. So this is why it's so important that we're able to treat our patients injunctively. We need to be able to fill in the gaps of treatment gingivitis patients. So we talked about a number um, during the learning objectives. Paraprotect's number is 10. 10 bleeding points or more. That's your sign to put that patient into paraprotect tree treatment. Because what we know is that bleeding is an accurate prediction of further periodontal damage. And not only that, but bleeding is an ulceration of the tissue that's caused by bacteria. So if you have patients tell you, I've always bled. <laughs> Bleeding is normal for me, right? I'm sure we've all heard this. Um, dentists, hygienists, dental assistants, everyone has heard this. Tell them that what that tells us is that you've always had some amount of bad bacteria that we've never been able to manage. So again, it's really important that we're able to fight the bacteria and therefore we're going to be able to treat that bleeding. New perio patients, this was my favorite way of treating patients. Um, definitely not a way that everyone has adopted, but it is possible to treat your patients before scaling and root planing with the help of IR, our IRX tray. So um, we do have another tray that's similar um, as, as far as like the structure, but it doesn't have that customized seal. Um, so it is just a generalized uniform seal. And the goal of this is to deliver oxygen below the gum line to jumpstart healing and to help break down some of those calculus deposits. So calculus is essentially like a protein skeleton that's been left behind. What the hydrogen peroxide is going to do is it's going to break the protein chain to make calculus easier to remove and actually keep it from rebuilding. So that's why I like to use trays before scaling and root planning. Not only that, but my results were absolutely amazing. Implant maintenance patients as well. If you have an implant in your, if you have an implant patient in your practice, maybe you're not placing implants, maybe you're just restoring them, or maybe you're just maintaining them. It doesn't matter. We need to be talking to patients about their implants because the majority of them aren't keeping them clean, right? They're brushing them, they're trying to floss them, they're water picking them, whatever, but we're still seeing periimplantitis, we're still seeing perimucositis, and it's because of, of bacteria. Restorative patients. My goal is to get the foundation, the gums really healthy before we go in and place a bunch of restorative. Maybe you wanna do the um, trays afterwards, again, so that we can keep those beautiful restorations long-term. So multiple ways that you can utilize this in the practice. Bad breath, halitosis. I'm instructing 
tons of clinicians to number one, be placing this on their medical histories. That way you can easily bring it up to patients if they've marked it on the medical history. But also what we know now is that some of the same bacteria that's causing bad breath is actually also what's causing periodontal disease. Um, so PG, Porphyrmonas gingivalis being one of the biggest ones, FN, and TF is another one. Um, and again, those are some of our key players in periodontal disease. So we should really be using bad breath as a precursor to perio. Uh, we're also going to be able to whiten because this is 1.7% hydrogen peroxide. So tell your patients, because I know that they've probably asked you, um, hey, we're going to be able to not only help treat your periodontal disease, help treat your gingivitis, but we're also going to be able to whiten your teeth and freshen your breath as well. And then your preventative patients and then your post-orthodontic patients as well. So there is a huge need for this throughout all corners of the practice. We just have to decide where are we going to utilize this? And just like Dr. Tom stated, Americans that are 30 years and older that have chronic periodontitis is almost 50%. It's teetering around 47, 48. Um, again, if we just want to round up and call it 50, it's almost half the population. So it's really important that we're looking a little bit deeper into how can we treat these patients effectively. And I think that we can all agree that this is completely unacceptable. So if you're seeing patients who are continuing to bleed in a prophy, if you don't have them on a D4346 or they're still continuing to bleed after scaling and root planing and still have pocketing after scaling and root planing, what can we do to help treat these patients? And um, we've conducted multiple studies. Also, for anyone who really wants to kind of dive deep into our research, you can visit paraprotect.com forward slash for you. Um, there is a, actually a specific link on antibiotics. So you're more than welcome to kind of peruse that website and um, do what you need to and see what sticks, but a lot of information there. Um, this was a percentage of reduction in bleeding on probing that was published in the Journal of Clinical Dentistry. So there was about 66 patients that went through scaling and root planing, and 63% of them still had bleeding after scaling and root planing. So when you see pre-treatment down in the lower left, um, that actually means before, or I'm sorry, after scaling and root planing, but before paraprotect. So when they put those patients, patients into paraprotect tray treatment, they immediately dropped them down to about 16, 17% at six months. So they did evaluations at six months, one year, and then two and a half to five, or two to five years. And as you're seeing from that horizontal line, two things extremely effective at lowering bleeding on probing but also you pretty much are going to get what you're going to get at six months to a year so again know this treat your patients really effectively within the first six months to a year and make sure that they're wearing their trays so always be bringing it up at all of their appointments um, using gel as a compliance tracker to make sure that they're utilizing these trays and these are the types of results that we're going to see so this is a case from Dr. Craig Buntemeyer, he's out of Arizona. Um, they had wore trays for three weeks prior to any sort of mechanical debridement. They did a full mouth debridement at week three, continued to wear trays for one more week. They brought that patient back four, or I'm sorry, one month later for scaling and root planing, wore trays that whole time, and then brought them back four months later um, for their first periodontal maintenance, and that was the final photo. So there's about six-ish months um, between these two photos, but absolutely amazing in terms of reducing pocket depths and bleeding points after scaling and root planing. Um, this is another great case out of Steamboat Springs, Dr. Jim McCright. Um, one of my um, colleagues, Jessica Berthelsen, she actually um, won an Orcos Award through this case through Paraprotect. So if you ever have a wonderful case that you want to submit to us, um, please do. We love to be able to celebrate that with you. Um, but this patient had a obviously gone through scaling and root planning. They still had bleeding and pocketing, so they decided to incorporate Paraprotect. Things are looking much better about a year later, um, but this is truly like the proof that's in the pudding. So they had done a salivary diagnostics test on them, which if you have not done salivary diagnostics, you are truly missing out. Um, I know that there's going to be some people up and coming that are going to be speaking about sal salivary diagnostics, so truly excited about that. But as we're looking at the high-risk pathogens, um, he had TF, he had some more moderate risk pathogens as well, but after about a year of treatment, they were able to lower the majority of those pathogens, which is, again, absolutely amazing. What we need to know, too, is that FN kind of plays both sides of the fence. So even if you see that FN is elevated um, after treatment, it's okay, because, again, she's, she's kind of playing both, <laughs> both sides of the fence there. But the goal of this is to lower the bacteria below the antibiotic threshold. So that black line that you're seeing across um, is the antibiotic threshold. So that we believe is if we can lower the bacteria 
below the threshold, we're going to eliminate the need for antibiotics in some of these cases. And the antibiotic threshold does change um, depending on guidelines and things like that. So that's where you're going to see those changes in the lower slide. So we need to create a standard of care. What's going to be your number? Maybe it's 10, maybe it's 15, maybe it's 20. Again, we believe 10 bleeding points or more, um, but determine a number amongst your teams and go out and start treating your patients. Be recommending this to everyone with bleeding, with pocketing, um, especially after scaling and root planning and definitely in gingivitis. And let's make a change in terms of dental hygiene and helping to treat periodontal disease and put these patients at less of a risk. And of course, if you want to reach out to me, you're more than welcome to. Um, this is my office number as well as my office email. You're more than welcome to reach out to me however you feel most comfortable. And I am just so thrilled that I was able to speak to you about um, how we can better treat patients again in this post-antibiotic era. And I want to thank Dr. Rowling also for having us. Thank you, Megan. And I hope you're able to hear me. Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> um, I got a little worried there last time. Uh, I want to see if we have any questions here for Megan. And I love the information that you added about C. difficile because it's so important, Megan. And it really, um, you all don't want your patients to ever get C. difficile and, and go through uh, an experience like I had, for instance. And right now, and it's an experience that never ends because I'm getting over COVID and there's a, case, a chance I have a secondary bronchitis and the specialists are trying to decide what to do with me because I can't take an antibiotic unless I go into the hospital. So I'm struggling here a little bit today with that decision. Um, any questions here? This will uh, be available online later. Yes, we are recording it. We have Megan's um, presentation in the course handout. So you have that with session one. Please reach out to her with any questions you may have. And Megan, thank you so much for being here. And this presentation you did was just excellent. Um, you have my approval on it for sure. And <laughs> you can't thank talk about antibiotic resistance without talking about C. diff. I mean, they just think- No, you can't, so. you really can't. And I had a resistant infection and it's a life-threatening infection um, that started with an extraction, right? So uh, again, it was an antibiotic I didn't need. If you're still prescribing clindamycin, you should remove it from your formulary because it was removed from the guidelines, the ADA in 2017 and again in 2021. Well, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Megan, and um, thank you, Periprotect. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us. We appreciate you. All right, everyone, we are going to log out. For those of you that are watching live, you will be redirected to a screen. If you did not take the quiz for session one yet, um, it is available. If you've already taken it, no problem. We're going to go ahead and prepare now for our session two. All right, so it will be starting at 11 o'clock Pacific time. Thanks so much for being here today. We really appreciate you all.